Well, good evening, everyone. So glad to have you in the Bible study tonight. We're starting something new. It's always good to start something new. Feel like we accomplished something in our last study. And uh, tonight we're talking about the Christian church in ministry. I will probably only call it the uh, church in ministry or a Christian in ministry because I think that's redundant to call it a Christian church in ministry. I, I think you, there, what, kind of, what other kind of church could we study? I just don't know what that is. But we're going to be talking about the church and ministry and the, uh, um, what God has called us to do in ministering to, to God himself and to ministering to one another and then ministering to the world, those three objectives that are there. Um, tonight we're looking at uh, uh, a universal problem and uh, trying to discover what that problem is. Um, in the world today. And I'm Pastor Joel Pledge. This is Crossroads Assembly of God, and we're glad everyone is here. All right? Let's see if I can go back, and we'll we'll start that up. Um, <clears throat> if you ask 100 people what are the biggest problems of humanity, you'd probably get 100 answers. Um, some will say it's poverty and drugs or human trafficking or racism or economic inequality or They'll talk about uh, immigration. All of these are big problems that our nation faces. Now, some people will come at it another way. They'll look at big government and big deficits and, and uh, politics as one of the big problems. The, uh, the list will go on and on. The debate will be louder and louder. The answers for the problems of the world will and do get more and more varied by the day. Um, they do fall into a number of categories. I, I just, just say that we like to throw money at problems. We like to uh, create government programs for problems. We like to write more laws for problems. We'll, we'll, um, we'll do anything to uh, not accept responsibility for changes in our own lives and what we can contribute. The Bible is both a very simple understanding of man's problems, humanity's problems, and a very simple solution. Simply put, the problem for humanity is sin. We're going to talk about that tonight in all of its different forms. The answer to the problems of, of humanity is a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and with God himself. When we ignore sin, we are ignoring the root of all other problems. We may talk about marital problems and financial problems and, and uh, addiction problems, but we got to get back to the root of that disobedience to God, that failure to recognize who God is, and the abdication of human responsibility. We're ignoring. We will ignore the root of all problems. When we ignore God, on the other hand, we're going to be ignoring the one solution that has eternal effects. God has a solution for man's problems that are eternal, okay? They're going to last forever. We can make temporary changes or temporal changes that may change our society a little bit or change our homes or families, but God has an eternal, um, eternal solution. Um, well, I, I keep trying to get to, the, to my verse, but I, I guess i got to keep talking about this sin problem, okay? We know the story of Genesis chapter 3 pretty well. Uh, it tells the story of human sin, a loving God who wants to rescue mankind from sin. God created a sinless world. He looked at that creation and said, this is good. How many of you know it was without sin? It was without sin. God said it was good. He created, he created man and woman in his own image. In his own image. He created us with intelligence, with the ability to communicate, the ability to express our emotions, the ability to rule. That's a good thing, to exercise authority and care and concern. Most importantly, we had the ability to communicate to, with God and fellowship with God. We had a relationship with him, and we were, we were created, I believe, body, soul, and spirit, and that spirit had a connection <laughs> with the God that created it. Um, I don't have this verse on my slides, but Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15 and 16 uh, say that God, through Christ, has created all things, both seen and unseen. 
Everything that was created was created through him and for him. Amen. Through him and for him. I don't think that's both verses, but that's uh, um, through him and for him. Let's see. Yes, those. Um, he made the things we cannot see and the things we can't see. Thrones, kingdoms, rulers, authorities, the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. Well, if, um, what does that mean? You know, if I could, if I, uh, cooked a, a meal for my wife, she came home and sat down and enjoyed this wonderful meal that I've prepared for. Her. Does happen once in a while. Don't think we don't. Once in a while, blue moons happen. We got a, we got a, a eclipse coming. They happen once in a, once in a lifetime. But if we create that, then we are creating something for their for her benefit. It will be nutrition for her. It will be sustenance. It will be enjoyment that uh, maybe it's a, a favorite meal. Uh, I think it's enjoy enjoyable in that she doesn't have to fix it herself. She doesn't have to, to be responsible for preparing it. So there is a uh, uh, a for her that is a blessing and intention. So this creation was for Christ, right? It was made by him and for him. So we see this, that, that God created something that would be a blessing for himself, for his son. Actually, God created, uh, God the Father creating through the son. Um, it was created for him, for his blessing. We can also see that there, there is this sense that in, in created for him that it was a gift to him, something that he had authority over or con control over or dominion over. Uh, if you have a bank account that's, that you have, it's for you, then you control it. Nobody else has uh, access to it. Nobody else is going to take it. It's for you. you. You make decisions about it, so forth and so on. Well, this creation was for Christ, and this is important for you to see that it was for Christ. When Adam was placed here, he was placed here as a, in a cooperative fashion to work with God, to spread the knowledge of God throughout the world, throughout the universe. He was going to share the knowledge of God with every part of this universe, to fill this, this creation with the knowledge of God. We know he didn't do that. We know he rebelled against God. And instead of him working with God, he becomes his, he, he, he's actually going to release his authority or lose his authority to Satan. One, uh, one part of um, free will, we, we think about free will and making our own decisions, and that's what God gave to humanity as, as, a, as a gift. One part of that, um, what is the right for, for Adam to choose his own ruler? Think about this. He had the right to choose his own ruler. So important to the story. Adam chose to disobey God. I'm sure in his mind he said, I'm going to make my own decision. I'm going to do what I want. I'm going to do what's best for me. Selfishness, pride. I can do this. All these I statements of what he's going to accomplish. But in fact, that what he did was that he surrendered his future to the serpent. He says, here's the keys to this place. Just go ahead. Because he, he released it. He, he lost his partnership with God. He no longer could fill the earth with the knowledge of God and with the, with the glory of God. Instead, he lost his place with God and lost the fellowship with God. And he also lost the rulership of this world for Christ. When Adam sinned, he handed the keys of this earth and their authority to rule to, to the devil himself. Now, you understand what Christ has done in reversing that, because on his resurrection, he said to his disciples, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Well, where did he get that authority? When he got the keys to death, hell, and the grave, he got the authority over this earth. He got that, he, he regained that authority. Every knee, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. What is that? Jesus Christ is Lord. He's the one in authority. All things are under his feet. What does that mean? Well, 
all things are under his authority. There is, there is that part of the work of Christ that establishes and reestablishes the authority of God upon this earth. This earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. That's what, what the, the prophet is going to declare. But that's also what Jesus declares. He says, I've come to establish my kingdom, the kingdom of God. It's going to fill the earth. He will have his authority upon this earth. Amen? Well, um, I do understand mo most of the time when we talk about the fall of, uh, of Adam, we're talking about a disobedience. One command, don't eat of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You can take, take of everything else, this tree, that tree, this plant, whatever you want, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, stay away from. Should have been fairly easy. I think I could have done it. How many of you think I, I mean, I, I think I could have done it. I mean, I, I really think that, that that is possible. But Adam couldn't. They're, they're tempted by the serpent, the they fall prey to their own pride and their own selfishness. And, and even though it shouldn't have been difficult to, to obey, they, they sinned and rebelled against God and disobeyed God. And, and they, they faced the consequences of that. They died spiritually. I've, I've mentioned to this to you before that the spirit of man, I, I look upon its death as, as, as a comatose state. In other words, that spirit is still there. But it can't respond to its environment. It doesn't respond to its environment. It, it may be able to hear the voice of God, but there's no life in that yet. There's no life unless God speaks life into it by the Holy Spirit, and that, that, that spirit is born again. But in Adam, when he sinned, that, that spirit lost its, its life and its connection with the Father, and he began to be ruled by that, by that soul. His mind took over. His in some cases, his body is going to rule. He's just going to follow the lust of the flesh, um, uh, the lust of the eyes, and pride of life, those things that we'll talk about in a, in a moment. But um, they are dominated then with that, um, uh, dominated by their sinful nature, and, and just, they're, they're, they're prone towards that sin. We know that. Well, um, the verse in... in um, Let's see, I think that's where I want to go right there. Let's see if I can get there. What do you think? Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Adam sinned. Sin entered the world. Okay, he's the gatekeeper. Sin entered to the world. Adam's sin brought death, spiritual death and physical death, because Paul's going to say, death spread to everyone for everyone sinned. Yes, people sinned even before the law was given. But it was not counted as sin because there was there was not yet any law to break. Oh, that's not a good sound. Still, everyone died from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even those who did not disobey an explicit command of God as Adam did. And now Adam is a symbol, a representation of Christ who was yet to come. Okay? Oh, let's see if we can. We can get down there. Well, that, that just tells us what happened. Adam sinned. Sin came into the world. Death came because of sin. And we become, uh, the, we, we know the creation became cursed. We know that, uh, that, that it led to um, uh, the work and the, the, the sweat. Uh, Adam would, would live by the sweat of his brow. His wife would endure the pain of childbirth. And, and they would be under really in, in an antagonistic relationship with the devil from that day forward. We ask that question of what is sin, and they're going to give uh, a, basically a, a three-part explanation. And uh, fairly, fairly simple for us to understand that, first of all, um, that sin is that act of rebellion, Okay. It is an act of rebellion. Here's what I'm talking about. When, when someone is in authority and we rebel against them, well, that's an act of rebellion. That's sin. God was in authority. He had established his rule over all the earth. He's going to rule that earth through Adam. But he, he, he has given 
Adam that command, and Adam will not recognize the rights of God. He will not recognize God's right to rule, okay? Um, Paul is going to quote there from, um, from Romans. <laughs> Paul, will quote, quote, Paul will say, yes, they knew God, okay? Even Adam, he knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God. He's talking about his society, but the same thing that Adam did. He didn't recognize the authority of God enough to obey him. They didn't give thanks. They began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like, and as a result, their minds became dark and confused. The very thing that was in Adam was in the Roman society in which Paul lived. There's a rebellion against authority. Obviously, that includes some pride and selfishness. I know more than he does. I can do it without him. <laughs> There's a lot of things that Adam could have said in, in those moments. But these are the, just the root causes of rebellion. Rebellion is against a person or against an authority. We also know that sin is an act of disobedience. Now, that presumes that there's a law. There's a rule. Okay? We have a, you know, we have no trespassing laws. Well, that means you've invaded somebody's territory or you've, you've, uh, you've invaded some right that they have. We've trespassed upon their their uh, their property or person okay that's a trespass the bible talks about a trespass talks about a transgression that's when you have a law you break that law you break it it's uh you you, you disregard it it's it's um it's i mean it's just just there disobedience also the biblical term is uh biblical greek word is hamartia which is um to miss the mark so when you take that arrow, some of you remember you were in class when I had that arrow and it shoots and misses the target. Well, so we all sin and fall short of God's glory. We all have that tendency, or not a tendency, but we, we don't have the ability to live up to God's standard. We just don't. Okay? It's not in us because of the sinful nature in which is there. Now, God says through Paul, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men. So there are those words are the words of disobedience, the transgression, the trespass that is there. And so God is going to judge those things. All right? Um, we are invited, we were created for fellowship with God really to be a part of the family of God. We, we've, all the earth has been invited to be a part of that family, to enjoy the blessings of that family, to enjoy the, the relationship with our Heavenly Father. Uh, but it is our choice. It, it, it is our choice. We, we, um, we want to look at, at, at John chapter 3 and verse 36, and it says, Anyone who believes in God's Son has eternal life. Anyone who does not obey the Son will never experience eternal life, but remains under God's angry judgment. Now, this is a principle that God establishes with the coming of Christ into the world. Eternal life here is not just longevity. Eternal life is a quality of life. Okay? It's a quality of life. It's having our source in the very life force of God. I don't know what turns off when you die. They study that all the time. They're trying to figure out, you know, what is consciousness and what is, what is it that turns everything off? We, we don't know. But I, I'm going to tell you something. When you go to heaven and you come into eternal life, the God becomes your life source. That's why eternity is what it is. The life source is God. God is eternal. And so his energy that he lives by will flow through us. It's not just that we will... You know, we have this longevity that has no purpose and has no, uh, has, has, <clears throat> it is separate from God's life. God's life comes into us, and God's life being eternal makes us eternal. Now, we believe, and there is eternal life, okay? We're joined with God, that quality of life that comes from a relationship with Christ, that, that kind of life that is, it is life-changing, it is transformative for us. But we can choose that life or we can 
choose death. It's up to us. Jesus has come, and we can obey him or we can reject him. That's the free will choice that God has given to us. Um, the third condition there of, or, uh, of what sin is, is a condition of bondage, a third description, a condition of bondage. Now, sin is not just divine, defined by its actions. It's not just a trespass. It's not just a transgression. It is also a state of being. It's a nature. Humanity are, are, are sinners by nature. Adam, when he fell, um, doesn't have the ability to live that good life, that eternal life. Now, there's always a debate in society, and it's gone back and forth, and I, I guess from generation to generation, is man born good? And then he's corrupted by uh, abuse or neglect or poverty or struggle. And then they end up doing sinful things or wicked things or evil things. Okay. So we're kind of living in that time now because everybody wants to see, oh, everybody's good. But there's this problem and that problem and this problem. This is why there's this, all of these social ills. The Bible's been very clear to us that man has a sinful nature. That he is prone towards sin. He is unable to change without God. He is unable to live a, a good, holy, righteous, servant life without God. That nature has bound him. Ephesians chapter number um, 2 and, and verses 1 through 3 says, Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. Okay, that's, that's Adam's condition. Once he fell, there he is. He's dead spiritually because of his many sins. The second verse says, You used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers of the unseen world. Well, um, it says you, 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 you used to live just like the rest of the world. In other words, we think we're independent, but really we're being influenced by society. High schoolers are peer pressure, media, social media. Boy, what a disaster it has become. Because all of it is influencing our society. Now, our, you know, our, 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 our young people no longer can think, well, I'm, I'm, I'm a, either a boy or a girl. Now I can be anything from a boy to a girl. I mean, it's, it's anywhere in between. You can just, that's because our society has decided that that's the way life is. Okay? What a crazy world in which we live. So the rest of the world just follows on in that, in that same river. It just floats down that river because, as, as Paul says, just like the rest of the world, that's where we live. Now, he goes on to say this is just obeying the devil. In other words, the devil has that, has that um, influence upon society. He is driving this, and he is, he is pushing this. And eventually, eventually, you're dead in your sins. You're just going along with everyone else. Thirdly, he says, there is a spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. There becomes an internal influence, whether it be a possession or oppression or a domination. There's a spiritual presence that leads us into sin and keeps us into sin, and, and, and we cannot escape on our own. Okay? So... Um, Paul's going to confirm that. Where, where, where was it? Oh, all of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our own sinful nature, and our very nature was subject to God's anger just like everyone else. Uh, so Paul says that's where we were. We were all subject to God's wrath, God's judgment, or death. Okay, if you want to say that, that's the judgment of God upon sin is death. Eternal death uh, will be the ultimate judgment. All right? Um, Paul says it this way in Romans 7, 14. So the trouble is not with the law, for it is spiritual and good. The trouble is with me. I'm all too human, a slave to sin. Whew. Wow. Just as a slave was sold into bondage, we have become the property of sin. Sin is a power that holds us. And we may, we may um, look at that as the devil. We may, we may, that may appear to us as um, I, I believe that there is a certain reality to that, 
But sin is a power. We're, we're slave to it. We can't change it. We have no way in ourselves to make that change. All right? Well, okay. How am I doing? I think I need to hurry. <laughs> I think I need to hurry. I'm on the scope of the problem somewhere. Let's see if I can get there. The scope of the problem. We know these things. I, I believe this can be or should be reviewed to us. Uh, sin began with one man. That began in the story of, of Genesis chapter 3. It begins with, with, uh, with Adam. He made a free will choice to disobey God, to rebel against his authority, to break the command, to transgress the command of God. He knew what he was doing. He did it of his own free will. Okay? He did it of his own free will. Immediately, he was guilty. Immediately, there was shame. Immediately, he hid from God. Uh, that knowledge of good and evil has plagued us ever since. Secondly, um, one man's sin was passed on to all. All right? We read that verse in, in um, Romans 5.12. When Adam sinned, sin entered into the world. It becomes a part of the fabric of this world and part of the fabric of our lives. And Adam's sin brought death, all right? Adam's sin brought death. So it's not just Adam's sin. He becomes our father, and through him, sin is passed along. Our sinful nature is passed along from that one person. This is, well, I could preach a great sermon there. I, I love that, that image that, that Paul has in 1 Corinthians 15, which is, is that Jesus is the last Adam. I love that because he, he puts an end to that Adam race, okay? He puts an end to that Adam race. Adam began a family in the garden, but Jesus puts a period at the end of the sentence. He's the last Adam, okay? He's also the first man from heaven. What does that mean? Well, he's got a new family, okay? There's a new family that's been created, and that's in the person of Jesus Christ. Um we got to recognize that sin by its nature is personal. Well, I wish I could preach that a little bit more. I do want to emphasize to you, if you read through your text, he almost, um, he almost is uh, giving us the doctrine of original sin. We are prone to sin. We're not born in sin. If we did, we'd baptize babies. Any church that baptizes an infant believes in original sin and believes that uh, that, that infant is inherently sinful, must be baptized in order to go to heaven. And we don't believe that. We, we dedicate children, and we have a sinful nature that's prone towards sin, but not sinful in and of itself until it sins, okay? Just, just to clarify there. Sin is personal by its nature. We sin against other people. We sin against God. Um, there's a relationship that's violated, okay? A relationship that is violated. And then we know this, there is a problem solver. Praise God that he loves us that much. Well, whew, we're still online. I just, just had a little blip here. I don't know if it blipped you off the uh, Facebook or not. First John, chapter number two. Um, Do not love this world nor the things it offers to you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. The love of the Father. You can say the life of the Father, eternal life. You don't have that in you if you love this world. And then he says, for the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, craving for everything we see, a pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, Ooh, but they are from this world. And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does... What pleases God will live forever. There is that life that comes from God. Amen. We recognize that the problem solver is the creator himself. He's the God of this world. He is found throughout. Uh, he was found in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. He's found on every page of human history. God has been there. I'll tell you right now, God is still at work in this world. Um, and in the end, when the last story of human history is written, if it's ever written, if it ever stops, God will be there as well. He is the one and only true God, 
And he demands, he has a right to be recognized as the one true God. He's the creator of all things. Amen? He is. God is that creator. He's the creator of the universe, everything that we see and everything that we don't see. All that dark matter that the science is looking for, God created it. Don't worry about it. God knows where it is. He's also the creator of the moral order of this universe. He established the rules and the laws of right and wrong. He establishes the highest standards of morality. He insists or has a right to insist that his laws be obeyed. And there are punishments when his laws are broken. He also sends Jesus to deliver us, I believe, to, do, to deliver us, not only to help us to obey, but to deliver us from those things as well. Um, the, final, the final truth is, is that God is Father. And there's three expressions of this that we find in Scripture. The first comes from um, the creation. He's the Father of all things. By virtue, He created it all. He's the source of it all. So there is a sense in which every person that's born upon this planet has a heavenly father. He created Adam and Eve, the beginning of all human race, and so everything has come from God. Now, this is also, I believe, misunderstood because a lot of people who don't know God at all claim to be children of God. They're going to heaven, and God loves us all, and we're all children of one God, and so forth. Well, let me just say to you, the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15, he was still, he was a child of the father, but he had no benefits of that, of that relationship when he was away from the father's house. He lived with the pigs and squalor and mud and filth. He had nothing to eat. He had no blessing of that relationship until what? He was reconciled to the father. So just because you say you're a child of, of God doesn't really mean anything if you don't have relationship with him, all right? Just that clarification. The other expression of fatherhood, let me, let me just stay there, it is in the person of Jesus. Jesus called the father my father. And there's a special, unique relationship that God has with his son that is not duplicated with us. It's a unique relationship. It's the one and only son that was given. And it's, it, it highlights for us the importance of, of, of that relationship, but also the greatness of the gift, okay? It was the one and only Son. It was the unique Son that Jesus offered, or that God the Father offered as a sacrifice for us. The third thing is, is that He is our Father by our reconciliation to Him. I love 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 19. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. Now, that new that word person there is creation. Uh, you are a new creation. God's still creating. He's creating. He's created you, a new creation. Well, that's important. Why? Because you're no longer part of this world. You're part of a new creation. You're no longer under the authority of Satan. You're under the authority of Christ because you're a new creation. Oh, that's so important for us. He goes on to say, well, all these things are a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us the task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. No longer counting people's sins against them, he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. What is God doing? He's the Father. He's reconciling his children to himself through Christ. He sent Jesus to die upon a cross so that we could be reconciled to his Father. We're adopted children in some ways, we're, 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 we're told. But we will be in relationship with the Father. And not only that, but we have that message of reconciliation that goes out into all the world. Well, praise God. Uh, we have a lot of things to study and a lot of things to look at and to learn. But we, we tonight look at the problem in which God has sent us to solve. He has not sent us to solve poverty. He has not sent us to solve immigration. He's not really sent us to solve abortion and drugs and alcohol. He has sent us to solve the sin problem. The broken relationship that man has with God. That's where it all begins. 
because that broken relationship is the source of everything else. Jesus, we give you praise tonight for who you are and what you've done for us. We are new creation in Christ. You have formed us and made us. You've given life to our spirits. You've given life unto us, eternal life. The Lord that energizes us and that will continue to provide life throughout eternity. And I thank you and I praise you for the answer, the solution to man's problems that you've given to us. I pray, O oh Lord, that as we make this study and go through this, that it will become real to us that, Jesus, you are the answer to the problems of this world. Jesus, you are the answer to the problems of our life. And I give you praise. I thank you for who you are and what you have done for us in the cross. We give all praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, God bless you. So thank you for joining with us, and we hope to see you again soon.